Yeah, I've been reading this to pass the time. It says here there's a southbound train that passes this one right after we leave Claypool. You're going to meet that train, Dave. Hello to all the classic people that are returning. I'm glad you're back. I want to welcome any new visitors. As a technical note, references and citations are listed for each show on the site at ClassicMovieRev.com. Today on Classic Movie Review, we are taking on the film noir, The Price of Fear, 1956. The Price of Fear, 1956 is rated a very low 6.3 on IMDb.com. It is much worse on RottenTomatoes.com, where it has neither a tomato meter score nor an audience rating. I did not locate a review from the time of release. Eric Summer at Film Noir Board Blog said, quote, Irving Glassberg's cinemagraphic favors low and sometimes oblique camera angles that are commonplace in noir visuals, and sometimes objects in the frame are positioned to appear larger or more significant than the protagonist. The good woman, Nina Ferrenti, Gia Scalia, is distinguished visually from the evil woman, Warren, by the differences in necklines. Wooden performances by the two leads detract from an otherwise enjoyable, well-paced film. Unquote. I didn't feel too bad about their acting skills. Oberon, Barker, Galia were a joy to watch. This movie has some surprising turns. The entire premise was original. And finally, the femme fatale for this movie deserves an honorable mention on my list of great femme fatales of film noir. Actors. Right, and I'm a Shakespearean actor. We have a few returning actors for this movie. First, as a great femme fatale is Merle Oberon in the role of Jessica Warren. Oberon was first covered in the southern gothic film noir Dark Waters 1944. Cicely Ray's Gia Scala played Nina Ferranti, the daughter of a hit-and-run victim. Scalia was first covered in the film noir The Garment Jungle 1957. Warren Stevens played the heavy Eddie Adair. Stevens was first covered in the great sci-fi movie Forbidden Planet 1956. Bing Russell, the father of Kurt Russell, played the uncredited role of Maxie. Russell was first covered in the campy Billy the Kid vs. Dracula 1966. Lex Barker played legitimate dog track owner Dave Barrett. Barker was born in Rye, New York in 1919. His family was very wealthy and the house was packed with staff. Barker graduated from the Phillips Exeter Academy. He then attended Princeton but left to join a stock acting company. He also appeared for a short period on Broadway in 1938. Barker was offered a film contract, but because he was underage, he failed to get the approval of his family. He worked labor jobs for a time before joining the U.S. Army in 1941, well before the U.S. was involved in World War II. During the war years, Barker rose to the rank of major. He was injured during fighting in Italy or Sicily. After his recovery and discharge from the Army, Barker traveled to Hollywood, quickly obtaining a small role in Dollface 1945. He started getting more roles, including a Western titled Return of the Bad Men 1948. In 1949, he obtained the role that made him famous. He replaced Johnny Weissmiller to become the 10th person to play Tarzan in a film with Tarzan's Magic Fountain 1949. Barker was in five Tarzan films before striking out for more diverse roles. After Tarzan, Barker obtained such roles as film noir Crossfire 1947, comedy Mr. Blandings Builds His Dream House 1948, Mystery of the Black Jungle 1954, Duel on the Mississippi 1955, and Away All Boats 1956. In 1957, this polyglot actor left the U.S. and began working in Europe. During this period, he made over 40 films, including Fellini's La Dolce Vita 1960. He eventually returned to the U.S. and was active on television. In 1973, he died of a heart attack at the early age of 54. Philip Pine played gangster and killer Vince Burton. Pine was born in 1920 in California. He had a face to play bad guys. Pine began making movies in 1945 and his career lasted until 1989. Some of the films Pine appeared in include The Setup 1949, Battleground 1949, DOA 1949, and Hoodlum Empire 1952. Around 1952, 
Pine began to work extensively on television. He also continued in movies with films like Men at War 1957, Murder by Contract 1958, Project X 1968, The Cat Ate the Parakeet 1972, and Money to Burn 1983. Some of Pine's better known television roles include episodes on The Twilight Zone 1959, The Outer Limit 1963, and as a notoriously evil human in a 1966 episode of Star Trek. Pine died in 2006. Story. Let me explain. No, there is too much. Let me sum up. Following the credits, the movie opens at a busy dog racing track. Rusty the Rabbit is circling the track and the dogs are set loose to run. The narration begins that the dog track has nothing to do with the story, but is that gangsters are trying to control the business. Vince Burton, Philip Pine, tears up his tickets when his dog loses the race. Vincent walks into the secured area where the dogs are weighed and inspected. Half owner of the track, David Barrett, Lex Barker, questions the gangster about how he gained access to the area. Vince says that Barrett's partner sold out to Burton's boss, Frankie Adair, Warren Stevens. Barrett is shocked by the news and goes to see Adair. At the Domino Club, Courtney, Frank Wilcox, is helping Jessica Warren, Merle Oberon, into her car. She seems a little wobbly from celebrating. Jessica is weaving across the lanes and singing to the radio. Adair is having dinner with a woman when Barrett arrives. Barrett is not very friendly to Adair as he examines the sales contract. Black Angus. Raise him on my ranch. It's best steaks in town. And when I operate a place, everything is the best. You'll find that out, Dave. Not if I can help it. Well, Dave, we're business partners now. Mm, you say so. Mm. I got a paper in here. It proves it. Signed by your former associate. How'd you get Lou to sell out? I think I pressured him. I didn't need to pressure him. He offered me a deal. Don't believe me, ask Lou. Barrett says he will not let Adair into the business. Adair offers to buy him out. Barrett implies that there'll be trouble with the commissioners. On the way out, Barrett runs into his old partner, Lou Belden, Tim Sullivan. Lou says they broke three of his ribs and forced him to sell. Barrett says loudly that he will kill Lou if he ever sees him again. Jessica is singing along in her car until she runs down an old man who was walking his dog. She gets out and the man is still moving, but she flees in her car. The man's good dog waits by him in the street. Barrett is riding in a taxi. He confirms to the driver, Johnny McNabb, Stafford rep, that he is being followed. Barrett has to pay the driver extra to slow down enough so he can get out. Barrett runs down the street while McNabb uses his taxi to block the other car. The driver of the tail car is Vince. Jessica calls the operator and asks for the police. Barrett runs around the corner and steals her car. Jessica tells the police that her car was stolen. Back in the restaurant, Adair is pouring booze into Lou. Vince lets Adair know what happened. He asks if Vince knows the cabbie McNabb. Adair says he will take Lou home so Barrett doesn't find him. Outside, Adair stalls until one of his men in a car drive by and shoot Lou. Barrett stops in Jessica's car and is trailed by a motorcycle cop. Detective Police Sergeant Pete Carroll, Charles Drake, comes in to see Lieutenant Jim Walsh, Dan Riss. Walsh has released a story in the paper saying Barrett is wanted for the murder of Lou. Carroll says Barrett didn't kill Lou. Carroll and Barrett are old friends. Walsh brings in a pawn shop owner who says Barrett bought a shotgun from him on the day before the murder. Carol punches holes in the man's story. Walsh gets a call that Barrett has been picked up for an auto theft charge. On the way down, a lab tech tells Carol that Barrett is responsible for the hit and run on the dog walker. The time of the hit and run was 12.31 a.m. Jessica comes into the police station about her car. Carol finds Barrett and says he is in big trouble. Get some pretty girls in your Bastille, Pete. Look, I didn't steal that car. Let's forget about the car for a minute. Talk about Lou Belden. Why? Because I got to find out who killed him, that's why. Lou killed? When? About two hours after you threatened to kill me. Carol asks about who killed Lou. Barrett has no idea that Lou had been killed. The time of the hit and run gives Barrett an alibi for the time of the murder. Barrett is taken to be identified by Jessica and Nina Ferranti, Gia Scalia. 
Baird is told that if the hit and run man dies, he will be charged with manslaughter. Nina is the daughter of the man that was hit. Baird is sure that the truth will set him free in time. Jessica is an investment advisor, and it sounds like she's doing some insider trading. I know that merger is not going to happen, but the time to sell is just before it doesn't happen. You agree? Good. Then we'll hold on a little longer. Barrett comes to see her. He explains why he took the car and says he didn't hit the man. He asks her why she lied about the car's location during the theft. Barrett wants to find who shot Lou. Jessica gives him an abrupt cue to leave her office. Barrett is brought back to the police station to confess to the hit and run. Before he signs the agreement, a cop comes in and instructs him not to sign because it would be perjury as they know he was on the other side of town killing Lou. Nina watches Jessica talk to Barrett. Jessica says she believes Barrett is innocent and they leave for lunch. Later, Jessica is getting ready to go out when Carol shows up at the door. The DA wants Barrett not to be charged for the hit and run so they can convict him of murder. Carol asks, what's the odds of a single car being stolen twice in one hour? The bell rings and Barrett comes into the apartment. Jessica tells Barrett that Carol suspects her of the hit and run. Barrett asks her point blank and she says she did not do it. Barrett says he has another alibi in McNabb, the taxi driver. The couple get friendly. The next day, Jessica goes to the taxi company looking for McNabb. The manager says everyone is looking for McNabb but no one has seen him since Friday. She does let slip that Adair is looking for McNabb also. As soon as she leaves, the manager calls Adair. Later, Jessica gets into her car and Adair shows up. He gets in and she drives to the most secluded spot in L.A. County. Adair says they are both looking for McNabb. Adair realizes that Jessica wants to have Barrett convicted for the hit and run. He threatens her if she doesn't turn over McNabb when he is found. The hit-and-run victim is not expected to live through the night. Jessica makes a begrudging truce. A delivery man brings a package that looks like flowers to Jessica's apartment. Barrett arrives looking for Jessica. Barrett says he didn't send flowers. When they open the box, it is a shotgun used to murder Lou. He immediately calls Carol. The police have already received a tip that the gun was in Jessica's apartment. Carol says he will have to get a statement from Jessica. Barrett talks him out of getting her involved. Carol asks Barrett to come by the office in the morning. Vince drops by the pawn shop in the morning. Vince runs into the back when he sees Carol and Barrett coming in with a shotgun in a box. Carol pretends to be Barrett. When they bust the pawnbroker's story, the old man starts looking in the back of the store. I'm the one you talk to at headquarters. Look, I, I, I don't see too good. I, Truth is that you can't see good enough to identify anybody now. Isn't that true, Belasco? I, look, I don't know who bought the shotgun. One of Frankie Adair's boys, I wasn't it? I don't know. Was it Vince Brady? Oh, look, I run a legal business. All the names are in my books. You can see for yourself. I'm not interested in your books, Belasco. Look, look in the back. Maybe you'll find the dead in the back. Look in the back. Look in the back. Vince runs out the back door, and they can't catch up with him. Adair calls Jessica at work to tell her that Barrett has been cleared of the murder charge. Adair says he is not content to have Barrett convicted of the hit and run. Jessica bluffs him and says they are going to do things her way. Adair sends Vince to tell Jessica in hopes that she will lead him to McNabb. Barrett goes to the unemployment office. He calls to break his date with Jessica and tells her he thinks he's found McNabb. She puts the phone on hold so she can come up with a plan. She says she can help and asks to go along. He gives her the address. Barrett and Jessica go to McNabb's house and get his wife, Ruth McNabb, Mary Field, to let them inside. Ruth says her husband is out of town. She is very nervous. Jessica takes over the interrogation. She slips Ruth $1,000 and a business card that says, Tell him nothing. Ruth continues with the story that she has not seen her husband. When the pair leave, Ruth opens the door and McNabb comes out. Ruth says that Jessica gave her a thousand dollars. They've gone. How'd they track us down, I wonder? I'm glad they did. Why? How's a thousand dollars for a reason? A thousand bucks? A woman shoves that in your pocket, she's got something to hide. When Barrett gets back to his apartment, Nina is waiting inside with news that her father has died from the hit and run. Barrett tries to defend himself, 
but Nina is not having any. She swears vengeance, then breaks down in tears. Barrett convinces her to sit and talk. Back at the McNabs, the couple is discussing their options. Ruth clearly doesn't want her husband to get involved. Johnny wants to go out for a drink, but Ruth says she will go. From across the street, Vince sees Ruth leave. Nina is getting ready to leave when the phone rings. It's Johnny McNabb wanting to talk to Barrett. Too late, Vince comes inside. Adair goes to Jessica's apartment. He says someone stuck a knife in Barrett's alibi, meaning that Johnny McNabb had been killed. Adair says Jessica is on his team now, or she will have to explain her involvement. He tries to embrace her, and she gives him a hard slap before leaving. Later, Barrett arrives. They go into the bedroom so she can finish her makeup. When Barrett tells Jessica about the call, she slips and lets out that she knows about the murder. What's the matter, David? McNabb telephoned me this evening. McNabb? Yeah, McNabb. But I thought you... What? Nothing. I... Uh, I was surprised, that's all. How did you know McNabb was dead? How did you know? I found his body. It was still warm when I found it. Well, then Frankie Adair was behind it. How do you figure that? He was here tonight. Frankie? Yes. Barrett says he found Johnny McNabb's body. Jessica starts telling how Adair blackmailed her into helping. She spins quite a yarn about her innocence and the threats Adair made. The bell rings and it's Ruth. Ruth says Jessica is responsible for the death of her husband. Ruth tells about the money and the card that Jessica gave her. Ruth is determined to send Jessica to jail if she doesn't pay a large blackmail payment. Ruth leaves with the understanding that she will be paid. Barrett tries to get the truth out of Jessica. She says she was trying to protect Barrett from a dare. She says she loves him. The desperate act of a murderous femme fatale. He buys it and sits by the fire. She tries to pour Barrett a drink, but her hands are shaking. He calls her out on the hit and run. She admits that she saw Barrett steal the car. He says they have to go to the police. She is still singing the I Love You story. Jessica wants him to forget and stay the night. Barrett agrees and they get all kissy face. And Barrett is shown putting a new log on the fire. Jessica says to Barrett that he will not turn her over to the police. Barrett says no, she will turn herself in. He also says that no one loves a patsy and exits. She has until noon to turn herself in to the cops. Later that night, Barrett is hanging out at his place when Nina shows up with a BS story of why she came. She says she knows he's innocent and she wants to help. Jessica calls to ask if he has told anyone about the hit and run driver. Jessica begs for one or two days to flee the country, saying she has left a full confession. She gives the train and coach number. Before he leaves, Nina asks if he is in love with Jessica. Barrett goes to the train and unknown to him, Nina has followed. She phones Carol and says Barrett and Jessica are leaving on the train together. Carol can't make it to the station before the train leaves, but he says he can intercept it at the next town. On the train, Barrett tries to stop Jessica from running away. No dice. She gives him her confession to read. Barrett says Jessica won't need the confession because they are getting off at Clayport, which is where Detective Carol is heading. Jessica agrees to surrender. Jessica and Barrett decide to head to the club car for a drink. At the door, she pauses for a moment and then says, never mind. Barrett opens the door and inside the baggage car, waiting for him with pointed guns, are Vince and Adair. Adair plans to throw Barrett into a southbound train past Clayport. Yeah, I've been reading this to pass the time. It says here there's a southbound train that passes this one right after we leave Clayport. You're going to meet that train, Dave. Jessica still tries to defend herself, saying she was just weak. Jessica asks to go to her compartment, but Adair makes her stay. When the train stops in Clayport, someone knocks on the door. Vince changes into a porter outfit and opens the door. He and the other porter load luggage. A dog in a cage starts barking. Barrett takes a chop at Adair's gun and gives him a good right. Vince throws a box and knocks Barrett back. Adair clunks Barrett on the head with a gun. Carol arrives just in time to jump on the moving train. Carol begins checking the cars with a conductor. 
Vince is waiting by the door to throw Barrett into the oncoming train. Carol finds Jessica's room. He asks about the club car, but the conductor says it's closed. A lady comes out and says she can hear her dog barking in the baggage car. The conductor, lady, and Carol go to the baggage car and ring the bell. The conductor's call is answered by Vince, and he is told that the dog is okay. The lady leaves, and the conductor tells Carol that that was not the right voice. Vince and Adair are getting ready to throw Barrett out onto the tracks when he kicks Adair and starts beating down Vince. Adair pulls his gun. Jessica rushes to help Barrett. Carol breaks in and shoots Adair. <coughs> Barrett asks Jessica why she saved his life. She says she loves him and then jumps out in front of the southbound train. <coughs> Carol arrests Vince. I'll be back with the conclusions and world famous short summary. This film is hard to summarize. There aren't any stories or interesting side notes. I must say, it was a tight film noir with some gorgeous actors. The femme fatale character was amazing. I kept waiting for her redemption with lines like, I lied to you, betrayed your confidence, and now I'm falling in love with you. Too late. Now Scala is no bum, but Oberon was so beautiful, and Barker looked like he was Tarzan in street clothes. How could they not end up together? A couple of things surprised me. The first was the only redemption for the film fatal was suicide, and she took that route in a somewhat gruesome manner. The second surprise is that the second female lead did not become the new girlfriend. World famous short summary. Having the body of Tarzan doesn't guarantee you will get the girl, but it's still the way to bet. Beware the moors.